Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you to Wordwell and National Monuments for um, asking me to give this opening paper on Irish Totters and the truly interesting stories that they can tell us. So the word toher, as Sharon said in the introduction there, comes from the Irish word toker, meaning causeway. And Lugannam, the Irish Place Names database, lists about 40 places in Ireland called toher or variation thereof. So they include places that are just called toher to the likes of Ballon Toher, Carrig Toher, or Knock Tofer in Kilkenny, and several other variations on the name. Now, in an archaeological sense, Toher is used solely to describe roads and paths that are built across bogs. And we also refer to them as trackways. And as we go through the paper, you'll see that I use both the terms interchangeably. About 1,500 Tohers or trackways have been identified by archaeologists in Ireland's midland raised bogs. Most of these were identified during campaigns of survey and excavation of industrial bogs owned by Borden and Mona. And so archaeological tohers are concentrated in counties Offaly, Tipperary, Meath, West Meath, Longford and Roscommon, with some sites also occurring in Galway, Kildare and Leash. And although the place name Tohar is scattered across the country and different landscapes, it is concentrated in the Midland counties, which makes sense in terms of the landscape and the archaeology there. So the scale and structural forms of Tahars can really vary from massive timber roads, which can run for several hundred meters, to much smaller paths made from light brushwood rods. So here you can see examples of a few different types. On the left, we see the huge Tahar at Anahoti County Tipperary. This was excavated by Kate Taylor and dates to about 40 BC. And certain, that's about a six meter wide trackway made of oak timbers. And that certainly qualifies as a causeway crossing the bog uh, crossing from dry land to dry land, crossing the wetland bogs. Up on the top right, then, we have a small Iron Age hurdle from Eder Clune County Longford. A hurdle is like a woven wicker panel that was laid down on the bog surface, forming a quite a small and simple path in this case. And then on the bottom there in Lamanahan County Offaly, we have some smaller brushwood paths, again dated to the Iron Age. These are just simple paths made down with longitudinal rods of brushwood placed in parallel bundles. So the scale of Tahars runs from short paths of just a few meters put down to cross maybe a difficult section of the bog and um, sites that perhaps only lasted a season or two to massive multi-phase structures built and rebuilt for several centuries. And a really important thing about Tahars that I'm going to be talking a lot about is of course the bogs in which they occur. They are repositories of the ancient environment, pollen, volcanic glass, insects and wood are all preserved and can tell us so much about the landscape in which Tahars were built, but also the resources which were exploited in order to build them. So Tahars are roads or paths. Could we go full screen on this, please? So Tahars are roads or paths, but they are so much more than that. And to illustrate this, we're going to take a chronological journey, which starts in Ederclune, County Longford where in 2006, I was very lucky to direct the excavation of an incredible complex of trackways and platforms, which date from the Neolithic to the early medieval period. This is Ederclune 45. It's one of the earliest sites we excavated, a beautifully preserved path, which meandered across the excavation area for 25 meters, but it extended beyond it, beyond it and could have run for much further. The people who built Ederclune 45 built it to a very specific design. Moving from west to east, they first laid down a, a rough substructure of longitudinal roundwoods. Over that, they placed occasional transverse roundwoods. And then on the very top, they put a dense layer of brushwood, which they wove under and over the, the transverses. So this created a really strong and elastic structure, which needed no pegs to hold it in place. Ederclune 45 had a walking surface of about 1.2 meters wide. So really this is a path rather than a road or a causeway. Analysis of the insect remains from Ederclune 45 by Dr. Eileen Riley tells us that the Tahar was built in the Fen, which is an early stage in the bog development when the ground conditions would have included pools of open water and trees such as alder and willow. So a really wet kind of uh, reed banks, a really wet landscape. A fen, of course, is a habitat really rich in natural resources like waterfowl, reeds and various other plants. And actually the insect remains from Ederclune 45 included dung beetles, which so there were animals in the vicinity of the site. It's likely that Ederclune 45 ran from the adjacent dry land and provided a footpath out into the fen where these abundant natural resources could be exploited. 
So what was happening in the landscape around Eder Clune when this path was built? Well, the building of the tower coincides with the distinct change in the pollen record at Eder Clune. The pollen at Eder Clune was studied by Dr. Gillian Plunkett in Queens, and Jill identified that around circa um, 3700 BC, so maybe 100 years before the site was built, the local landscape, which had been dominated by woodland, saw a substantial rise in grasses and weeds. Now that signifies that the land is being cleared, humans are, people are felling trees, and they're opening up the land for agriculture. So trees were felled to make, trees were felled to make the fields or open ground for crops, but also to build the tower. And Dr. Ingelisa Stoich, who analyzed the wood from Eder Clune, identified that this trackway was built mostly from young trees of hazel, but also pieces of birch, alder, and apple or rowan type wood. And these trees all came from different parts of the landscape. The hazel used in the site were all long straight rods, which would have come from a relatively dry area at some remove from Eder Clune Bob. And the hazel was all harvested young, mostly at three years old, so possibly in a formal woodland management situation. In contrast to that, then the apple and rowan type uh, pieces were really mixed in age. They range from really young saplings and shoots right up to old pieces of like 45 years old. And they came from a much more natural scrubby kind of uh, forest area. And in that area, the people who were harvesting the trees didn't mind. They weren't just looking for the young pieces. They took all the wood they could use. Then finally, the alder and birch came from a more marginal setting and were possibly harvested around the edges of Eder Clune Bog itself. So this tower at Corlay, about 25 kilometres southeast of Eder Clune, is a mirror image of Eder Clune 45. It's built in the exactly same manner, moving from west to east and approximately at the same date. But this site runs for several hundred metres, demonstrating that these paths could actually form much longer routeways through the landscape. And to be fair, Ederclune 45 could have extended for further. We just excavated it in a narrow road corridor. The similarity between these sites is really striking, and it's possible that they were built by groups of people between which there was contact and shared knowledge. In this slide, I've also included a close up of the tool marks on the wood in Corlay 9, because, of course, the wood in these sites was worked using stone axes. So bringing these Neolithic sites together, they have a lot of information to give us. We can see how they were built by people who used stone axes to work the wood, who cleared the land for farming and exploited different parts of the forests in different ways. They are simple paths, but they're no less, no less for it. And we're very lucky to have found them and worked on them. Trackways of this age are relatively rare in the archaeological record. The Neolithic trackways are, are few enough. And these, these sites really have a, a great story to tell us because of the environment, environmental evidence that's preserved within them. So staying with Eder Clune, and can we go full screen on that, please? moving into the centuries of the late bronze age and early iron age we're going to look at some very different tahars to eder clune 45 and these tell a really different story so these centuries at eder clune became the focus of a very particular type of trackway building and during this time a network of very large interconnected sites was built out in the bog that's the plan of the sites there on the left now, unlike Ederclune 45, these sites didn't extend from the nearby dry land, but rather they ran parallel to it. So on the site plan there, the dry land lies sharply to the right hand side and the trackways are running more parallel to it. They're certainly not extending from it. So these trackways allowed people to move within the bog and where they crisscrossed, they allowed people traveling from different directions to join other routeways and change their track. I also think it's likely that the crossroads of these trackways formed platform areas in their own right, places where people could come from different directions to congregate out in the bog. The sites that form these ne this network are really large structures. They're up to three meters wide and several of them were built with multiple layers to over a meter in depth. Radiocarbon and dendrochronological dating has demonstrated that two of them and in all likelihood three of them, so the three uh, parallel lines, you can see there the yellow the, and the two blue. Uh, the dates suggest that they were built and rebuilt over several centuries, starting around 1400 BC and up to about 50 BC. So that's an intergenerational time span when these routeways were being maintained, if not constantly, at least periodically. And while they do in many ways take the form of tahars, and I do believe that they functioned as routeways, 
it is possible that they also functioned as boundaries. So what is happening at Eder Clune at this time? Can we go full screen on this again, please? Thank you. Well, in addition to building large, deep interconnected sites, the people who built and maintained them were burying artifacts. Wooden artifacts were buried at regular intervals at places where the sites connected and they were or and often very well hidden deep in the bottom of the trackways. In this diagram on the right, every red point marks the location of a wooden artifact and there were 46 in total. There are no Irish or other parallels for such structured artifact deposition in a tar or trackway site. Artifacts are very often included in tahars, often fragments of worn and broken objects and often interpreted as, you know, things that were being discarded and they're thrown into the bottom of the trackways as foundation material. And to be fair, that probably is sometimes the case. But here at Eder Clune, the sheer volume of artifacts and the, just the clear pattern of deposition indicates that this was more than just discard. Added to the fact is that several of the items were unfinished or unused, so we're certainly not looking at discard after breaking. So we'll just take a look at some of the really beautiful objects that were found in the Eder Clune Towers. So there were useful things in the assemblage. There were axe hafts, there were spears, there were mallets, there were clubs, uh, there were tool handles and the like, and these are all useful objects. Some of them might have been used in the building of the trackway, but some of them, the, the axe haft there, completely unused, the spears completely perfect, all buried deep in the base of the trackways. There are also wheels. Here you can see two wheel fragments on the right hand side. Both of these were very well used in antiquity. They have gravel embedded in the outer rolling surface of them and they're both incomplete. They're just small fragments of what you would term a fellow or a wheel rim like a wooden tire. And then on the opposite side, we have the Ederclume block wheel, the earliest block wheel portion from Ireland. And this is unfinished and buried deep in the base of a late Bronze Age trackway. Interestingly enough, none of the trackways at Eder Clune were really suitable for wheeled vehicle, vehicles, yet wheels have been buried in three trackways, and these are three different dates. So we have the late Bronze Age block wheel, the Iron Age uh, longer wheel rim on the bottom there, and then the upper piece is from an early medieval trackway, but may actually be anachronistic, it may be an earlier find. Moving then on to domestic vessels, uh, a range of different domestic vessels represented in the Ederclune trackways. We have tubs, we have dishes, we have vessel lids, and we have the beautifully carved bowl on the right there with the lovely perforated handles. Now, in contrast to the tools, the vessels are nearly all used. None of them are complete. Um, they have scorch marks, they have wear marks, and they definitely were all used before their deposition in the site. And then we have enigmatic objects. These six lovely objects across the top here, these are pieces of hazel brushwood around which a piece of honeysuckle has grown in a spiral pattern. Now, this happens in nature where the, the honeysuckle grows around and the two fuse together. So these art artifacts did form in nature, but then they were harvested. And as you can see on some of them, they have been additionally polished and trimmed along their length. These were buried in two different sites in Eder Clune. There was four of them in a late Bronze Age trackway and two of them in an Iron Age trackway. And I think these were probably used as decorative portions of walking sticks or staffs. On the bottom then, we have this very enigmatic object from a late Bronze Age platform at Eder Clune. It's made of slow wood and it's about a meter long, uh, beautifully worked and pointed at each end, function unknown, broken in two pieces actually before it was deposited function unknown. So the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age trackways at Eder Clune are more than just routeways or paths. They are a vehicle for expression of belief. They are structures with more than a practical function. And as I said earlier, they may have functioned as boundaries, physical or perhaps even spiritual or meaningful boundaries in the landscape. And of course, the burial of artifacts in these sites has resonance with boundary deposition, which has been explored elsewhere in Irish archaeology, but particularly Eamon Kelly's work on bog bodies and the deposition of bog bodies and artifacts on boundaries within bogs. But also more generally in archaeology, the idea of objects being deposited on the edges is, com is commonly encountered and commonly understood. So staying in County Longford, 
We move on to Corlay and looking now at probably the most famous Irish tower, Corlay One, which was excavated in the late 1980s and early 1990s by Professor Barry Raftery. Corlay One extended across Corlay Bog to a small island, beyond which it reappeared in Derahorn Bog and so had a total length of some two kilometres. I think it's the longest Irish tower ever recorded, and it certainly formed part of a regional routeway, which Barry suggested may have been associated with the ritual sites at Rathcrohan and at Ishnock. Corlay was a huge structure built with longitudinal roundwood runners, over which were laid massive oak planks of three to four metres wide and up to 20 centimetres thick. These were often held in place with long birch pegs, which were hammered through mortises in the ends of the planks. Now, wood studies on Corlay suggested that up to 25 hectares of forest were cleared for its construction, transformed into planks and pegs, and transported to the bog in as much as a thousand cartloads for the upper surface alone. What's more is that the three ring studies, which dated Cor the Corlay section of the road to 148 BC and the Derahon section of the road to 156 BC, also identified really consistent felling dates across the trackways. So it's likely that the forest was felled, the timber prepared, and the road was built in a very short period, perhaps a season. So what story does Corlay tell us? What does all this tell us? Well, building this is a huge undertaking, a massive communal project. And so this tower tells us about societal organization, about command of resources. And Barry suggested that its construction was a deliberate assertion of power, that it was a conscious statement by a powerful dynasty. Corlay is certainly the most famous Irish tower, and um, it's what springs to mind when most of us think of bog trackways and trackway archaeology. But I should point out that sites like Corlay are actually rare. There are very few sites with which it can be com compared. And a Ahoti that we saw at the beginning is of a similar scale, but much shorter. And more recently, there's been excavations in Clunshanabog and County Roscommon of a similar Iron Age trackway. But generally, these huge, big causeways forming regional routes are rare sites. So leaving prehistory and County Longford behind, we're moving south to County Offaly and the Lamanahan area. Lamanahan bogs were sur first surveyed by the Irish Archaeological Wetland Unit in the 1990s, who identified about 650 sites in the space of three to four years. This was and probably still is one of the densest, highest densities of wetland archaeology in the world. The sites dated from the prehistoric to later medieval period, and I hope you can see clearly in the map here and in the aerial photograph that the sites are very much concentrated in the narrow crossing points in the bog and also around the islands. I hope you can see in the aerial photo in the, in the, in the area of Brown, which is the industrial bog, there's a green spot in the middle, which is an island known as Broder's Island or Derry Van. And then on the south there, what looks like a, a sort of a wide peninsula jutting out, that's Lamanahan Island that was originally an island is now more of a peninsula due to reclamation. So Lamanahan Island there at the southern part is, of course, the location of the early medieval ecclesiastical site of St. Monken's Church. His monastery was founded there in AD 645. So with all this going on in the bogs, I'm going to focus on some medieval sites in Lamanahan as these tahars tell us another type of story. So we're going to begin with a tower that was located in the northern part of the bog there around that central island known as Broders or Derry Van. Um, I'm not sure if you can probably make out on the map on the left, you've got the island in the middle and just north of it, there is a line running towards it. And that line extends out the far side. And that's the first trackway in Lamanahan that I'm going to talk about. So this trackway was identified by the Irish Archaeological Wetland Unit, who traced it running across the bog for about 500 metres. It extended from dry land at Kill and Tubber across the bog to Broder's Island. And then on the opposite side of the island was another site of similar date and construction, which ran on towards Lamanahan Island. There were two phases of excavation, first by the Irish Archaeological Wetland Unit and later by Ellen O'Carroll, both in the 1990s. This trackway is built to a very specific design of which there are several running around Lamanahan and they all run in between the bog islands and the dry land. These are colloquially by archaeologists called single plank walkways. And how they are built is, well, in this case, there are three layers of wood used in the site. So the site has a lower substructure of thin longitudinal timbers over which were laid spaced out transverse roundwoods, which were firmly pegged in place. Then over the transverses was laid finally an upper walking surface of single planks laid end to end. 
So basically, this would have been an elevated, narrow walking surface of 30 to 40 centimetres wide. Tricky enough to use, I would imagine. The exceptional find from Ellen's excavation was this crozier. It's carved from blackthorn with a crooked end in which is inscribed a simple Greek cross. This was found just alongside the trackway in a vertical position. And we have to imagine that this was a purely accidental lost, loss made by a senior cleric, perhaps a bishop as they crossed the bog, maybe putting the crozier down on the surface to steady themselves as they walked on the narrow planks and boom, the crozier disappeared into the wet peat lost for centuries. There is, of course, a much more famous Le Monaghan crozier on display in the treasury of the National Museum of Ireland. But this, I think, is the only crozier ever found on an archaeological excavation or certainly on a modern archaeological excavation. And here we can see the lovely reconstruction um, of the trackway. You can see how it was built with the longitudinal substructure, then the transverses and then the slightly elevated end to end laid planks and we have our, our clergyman walking along with his crozier still intact at this point. So now we're moving on to our last site, uh, still in Le Monaghan, but we're down south in Derry Nagun townland. This Tahir for me is the jewel in Le Monaghan's crown. I don't know of any other Tahir that can really tell the same story as this one. So we're now in the southern part of Le Monaghan in Derry Gun. And looking at this site, if you can see on the map there, there's a solid red line and it runs from the dry land across Derry Nagun Bog to, to Le Monaghan Island. And if you can just see there, that is the line of the site running across the bog today. On the right hand side is how the site appears now on the bog. And I took this photo just a few weeks ago. So this site was also subject to an excavation again by Ellen O'Carroll in 1996. And it's actually the first excavation I ever worked on. So that's probably why I have such a soft spot for this site. This is a multi-period tower, which extends across the bog for at least 750 meters and has five very distinct construction layers. So the first phase is a layer of substantial longitudinal planks, which have been dated to AD 653 plus or minus nine years. So really contemporary with the foundation of the monastery on the island, which was in AD 645. These are overlain by a deep layer of clay and gravel, which was topped with a cobbled surface, which has a curved edge. Over this layer was another substantial wooden uh, layer, this time of transverse oak planks, the edges defined by longitudinal timbers and a row of double posts. So this phase of construction, again, a really substantial solid structure. And this has been dated to AD 1158, plus or minus nine. Over this was laid a less substantial layer of brushwood, which, you know, that's, that's what they did. They replaced the timbers, perhaps the surface getting a bit worn and a, a smaller brushwood layer laid over the timbers. Now the brushwood was overlaid by peat, which suggests that the site was abandoned for a period. However, the route was re-established and a final layer of boulder clay topped with large flat flagstones was laid down. So the building of this site is really contemporary with the foundation of the monastery in AD 645. And although St. Moncon died in AD 665, the site continued to be used and was rebuilt for a long period. This is the site in the bog today. The upper layer of flagstones is exposed and vegetation is taking hold on the dry surface. It actually appears as a line of green growth across the bog. But really unusually for a tahar, this site runs onto the dry land. And here it is up on Lamanahan Island where the flagstone surface is clear poking out of the grass. And this is where they lead you. You come off, off the bog walking on the tahar and first it brings you to St. Mela's cell the cell or hermitage which St. Moncon built for his mother. Now this building that remains probably dating to between the 10th and the 12th centuries. Walking along the Tahir, you then come to a bull on stone and St. Moncon's well, which has a number of cures associated with it and a pattern day on the 24th of January. And finally, the trackway brings you to St. Moncon's church, the upstanding remains of which are later medieval. On a recent visit to Le Monaghan, I was told by a local man that his mother walked this tower in the 1920s to get to mass on the opposite side of the bog where the modern church is now located. Now, there are a small number of similar trackways from County Offaly that compare with Derry Nagun, most notably Bloom Hill, which was excavated by Thaddeus Breen and Connor McDermott, and one in Dangan South Bog, which may have functioned as a mass path. 
but I don't know of any Tahir, the construction of which started in the seventh century that was still in use in modern times. That's really quite remarkable for this site type. Bog trackways are rarely so long lasting in the physical sense, but also in their sense of purpose. Derry Nagon was built as a route for people to travel to their church and practice their religion around AD 653. And it was rebuilt time and time again for the same reason. And that reason persisted right into the 1920s. And the Tahrir still exists. You can still walk along sections of this path on the same route as people did in the seventh century. And that story is really something special. And so to conclude, I'm a little bit early. And so to conclude, Irish Tahrirs and the stories they can tell us are really varied. On a prosaic level, they are simply routeways. They are people moving from one side of the bog to the other or going out into the wetlands. But the preservation makes them special. Stories of the ancient environment, of the growth of bogs, of forests, of the effects of farming and the management of the land and the forest. And then some Tahrirs do seem to have been more than just routeways. At Eder Clune, we see how these sites were vehicles for expression of belief evidence of ritual life, but also through the wooden artifacts, we have things that rarely survive in other contexts. And we can see the incredible woodworking skill and material culture of late Bronze Age and early Iron Age people in County Longford. At Corlea, then we saw how a Tahir could also be an expression of power, command of people and resources and a conquering of the landscape. And then finally in Le Monaghan, a medieval pilgrim or mass path to an isolated church on an island. Again, a connection to spiritual life, but also an incredible story of continuity. So Tahrirs really are more than just roads. They can reflect multiple aspects of our past and they are really important sites in our archaeological record. And that's me done. Thank you for listening.